I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let's start. Let's start by praying. Ah, Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you have made a means for us to know you, to know the Father, um, to be filled with your spirit. And um, that is because of your death for us. Well, first, because of your sinless life for us, your death for us on the cross and your resurrection. And as we come today, where most of the Christian world is discussing, or at least the Western Christian world is discussing, discussing your resurrection, Lord, I pray that um, the clarity and the power that we get from that would dwell in our hearts, Lord, that the resurrection would not be some fable. It wouldn't just be some distant idea, but we would see our lives living through this supernatural truth. Today, God, as we come to the word, as we come to this message, God, I pray against distractions. Um, Lord Jesus, any distraction that is oppressing anyone who's watching this, either now or later, um, whether it would be from within their head, whether it would be their environment or their surroundings, in Jesus' mighty name, we just silence all of those. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak so loudly in our hearts that we wouldn't hear from any other voices but you. Every assignment of the enemy will cancel in Jesus' mighty name. For me, Lord, I pray that you would guard me from distractions, both within and without, Lord. Help me to focus in on your word. Help me to hear from you in a clear way. Help me to speak what you want me to speak. Help me to silence myself where um, there are words that you don't want to be spoken. I just submit this entire time to you, Lord. I submit my mouth to you, Lord. I submit um, my thinking to you, Lord. I pray that the words that I speak would be like you, Jesus. They will be words of life and not words of flesh. I pray that when I speak, Lord, that there will be a impartation of truth and spirit to people. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So, as you guys know, it's Easter. Happy Easter to you. Um, <laughs> I got to confess something <laughs> because maybe it's just because I'm not as, um, my family, we're, we're not really the holiday family. Like we, we celebrate some holidays for sure. Um, but we celebrate holidays for, because we like the things like, for example, um, we celebrate Christmas. We don't, we don't celebrate Santa Claus, but we give gifts because who doesn't like getting gifts? So there's no like holiday aspect to it. It's just the 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 goodness of it, we should say. And so um, I think that's part of the reason I completely forgot that it was Easter. And um, <laughs> part of that is if you don't know the background, you go ahead and do your Googles or just if you have atheist friends on Facebook, I'm sure they've told you a million times this week that Easter is pagan. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to go through all of that, but I bring that up because as if you've been watching, you know that we have been going through a talk on Revelation. And as we've been going through Revelation for the last however many months, we often take these exit routes and we go deep on things that we see. And a few weeks ago, we saw in Revelation 7 that, well, first we saw in Revelation 6 that God is actually in the midst of undoing this world and bringing a new world to fruition. That the end of days will not be a plague. It won't be nuclear war. It won't be this Armageddon type of, 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 um, scenarios that you see on TV that the end of the world will actually be when Christ comes. We saw that in, we saw the beginning of that in Revelation 6 and he calls it tribulation and then in Revelation 7 we see that all of that is is pause in a sense and not necessarily like those times are stopping but in the midst of that we see that God is actually pulling out people. He calls them a kingdom. He calls them holy priests and this is what we know to be the church. And we've been going through this series or we've started this series of, okay, who is the church? Who are we? And, and we found that it's very important that we have clarity on this topic. It's very important that we know who we are. And so we've talked about the birth of the church. We've talked about how we got here. We talked about our mission, which is to, to serve, not just man, but to serve God. We're here for service. There's a reason God didn't just take us out. We are still here to minister to him and to minister to people. And we saw last week that in order for us to do that, God was going to consecrate us. 
And he consecrates us by giving us the righteousness of Christ. He consecrates us by giving us peace because of the sacrifice of Christ, i.e. his blood. And then we see that he consecrates us with oil. Now, I had a great talk on that, um, and I'm still going to talk about that a little bit, but I'm not going to go deep into the symbolism of the oil and all that. I will tell you this, that it's the Holy Spirit. The, the oil that we see in the Old Testament is a picture, a picture of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we get that in the church. And one of the, the, the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about today was how that oil actually works into power for us. And we see that in the gifts that God gives us as believers, something that we call spiritual gifts. And then I remembered it was Easter. <laughs> and my initial response was, okay, um, everybody's preaching on the resurrection. It's Easter. Don't I have to speak on the resurrection? <laughs> my immediate thought was, yes, as I sought the Lord, I've seen that. No, that is not the case. Um, one of the things that's so interesting about the resurrection is we are told that as often as we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are actually to proclaim the resurrection of Christ. And we do that through communion, but we also do it on a day like Easter. And it's important that we do it. But what I want to submit to you is as I begin to talk to you about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the idea that it is a separate talk from the resurrection of Christ, I hope that I will take that out of your mind. Because even when we come on Easter and I pivot to talk about the resurrection of Christ, it's not really a pivot. It's us understanding the power in which we come in. And so I'm going to read something to you. Um, I'm going to be in two main scriptures, so you don't have to worry about you following, if you want, I'll tell you what the scripture is, um, but I want you to stay in the main two scriptures. But I want you to hear the Apostle Paul when he's writing to the Corinthian church and he's talking about the resurrection of Christ. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And then he tells us what he received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. So what's he saying? He's saying, I want you guys to know that I'm preaching the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. But I want you to know that this resurrection wasn't something that people just were saying, hey, um, I heard that Jesus was resurrected. No, instead of that, they were saying, he actually appeared to people. He appealed to, appeared to the disciples, obviously, but then he also appealed to, appeared to over 500 people. And when Paul is writing that letter, he's telling them most of whom are still alive today. See, for the early church, the resurrection was something that they preached on often, but it was something that they believed to be a fact. And I have to say that because if we weren't in quarantine, we would we, we all know if you've been in the body for long enough, you know that Easter Sunday is a packed time. There's a lot of people who come for Easter Sunday. There's a lot of people who come for Christmas. But at the end of the day, the question remains, are you here because it's part of your holiday tradition and you get to dress nice and you get to wear really poppy clothes? Um, or are you here because you believe that there is a resurrection from the dead and it's the son of God? As you believe that, if that is the case, if God is raising people from the dead, what else on this world matters? See, the story of the resurrection is not a story that is an allegory to teach us about God. And, and a lot of us, we, we would never say that, especially as believers. And for you guys who are like the believers that are kind of like, well, my mom was always a Christian, so now I'm a Christian. We would never say like, no, the resurrection didn't happen. But we, we operate in that, in that way. See, the resurrection is not an allegory. It's not a, an allegory. It's a story that teaches. It's a real life account that shows us the power of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.20 that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. 
Because it's so, it's, it's like, it's almost insane to me how often I have conversations with, with what the Bible would call lukewarm believers. And in those times, it's like, yeah, of course, yeah, we believe in Jesus and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, we're, when we say we believe in Christ, we're saying that we believe that God has resurrected someone from the dead. That is a, a, a life altering thing. This is why we should celebrate the resurrection, because it points to the power of God. The resurrection shows us that Jesus was who he said he was, because only God has the power to raise from the dead. And this is why I want to continue to talk about spiritual gifts, because while we believers are familiar with the story, the question that I have for you is, are you familiar with the power? The statistics don't say it. Like, let's just be honest. When you look at the statistics of the American church, here's what you see. You see a lack of prayer. You see a lack of Bible reading. And when I have conversation, conversations with most people who profess to be Christians, the idea of wanting to do the things that God loves is few and far between. To me, that doesn't smell like people who believe that God actually rose someone from the dead. But here's the thing. In Philippians 3.10, Paul said that it was his goal to know the power of the resurrection, not the symbolism of the story. And what's so interesting is as you go throughout your Facebook feeds, as you go throughout your YouTube feeds and you see all your stories, this is no disrespect to anybody in particular. I'm just being honest. Like I've sat in enough resurrection days and we say, you know, Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And, and, and most of the talk has to do with how the resurrection is a symbolism for something in your life. But unfortunately, the resurrection is there to show us power. Yes, it redeems us, obviously. But he's there to show us power. That's why in Philippians 3.10, Paul says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. In Ephesians 1, 19 through 20, Paul is talking about what he prays for the churches. And this is what he says. He prays that they would know what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Here, Paul is making the connection between God raising Jesus from the dead and the power that's available because of that. Romans 6, 4, Paul says this. He says that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. I want you to take a second and think of everything that you're struggling with, everything that you're having a hard time with, if it's sin patterns, if it's a, if it's a difficulty in life, and you've, you've been the type of person to say, well, you know, I'm going to pray about it and ask that God, you know, help me. But then you go back to other things to help you and, and you, you seek other, other people to help you. And, and your prayer life is really the, the only thing that you really cling on to. But deep down, you don't believe that God can help you. I want you to know something that your newness of life is not linked to your faith. Your new, it is, but hear me, the newness of your life, the power is linked to the resurrection. When you have faith, you have faith in Jesus, but it's not just this, this, this intellectual idea of, of belief. I believe that Jesus was who he said he was. I believe the Bible for this reasons, and it makes sense this why. No, you are believing in the power of a God who can resurrect the dead. And if God can resurrect the dead, What is your life supposed to look like? Most of the body is aware of the resurrection, but silent on the power of that resurrection and ignorant of how the power now is supposed to work in us. My question for every believer is this. Do you live such a life as a disciple of Christ that the resurrection of Christ makes sense? Would people see just an inkling of the power that raised Christ from the dead? In your life, the resurrection of Christ is what sets us apart. Understand something, guys. Jesus came and he was a good teacher. And I want you to know that that Jesus doesn't have a stronghold on the teaching game. Confucius came. He was a good teacher. And then he died. Gandhi came. He was a good teacher. And then he died. Muhammad came. 
He was a good teacher, depending on who you listen to, and then he died. Every yogi comes, they're good teachers, and then they die. But Jesus came, he was a good teacher, he died the death that we deserved, and was resurrected on the third day. That is what makes us different. Not that you can apply this book to your life. We are not, as believers, we are not simply a set of beliefs. Christianity is not simply a worldview. We are people chosen by the power of God, saved by the power of God, and now living in the power of God. Your faith is a supernatural one, shown by the resurrection of your Savior and through the lives of his followers. This is one of the reasons why we need to have this talk. Like we need to talk about spiritual gifts. And I want you to hear me because I know when we talk about spiritual gifts, especially in the Western world, we're already not spiritual in how we think. We think very, very um, worldly in a sense of touch, taste, understand. If we can touch it, taste it, understand it, it's real. If we can't, it's not. So even as a Western believer, you're already up against it because you have this Western thinking already. And then comes along people when they talk about spiritual gifts, they get really weird. And they, they do some things that are offensive. They say things that are weird. Some things don't seem right. But I want you to get out of that because this is not a talk for you to, to, to become the next whoever is going to come into your mind. I'm not going to name anybody. This is a talk about the gifts of the spirit, not because it's cool, but because they are needed and we need to understand them. While we take this time to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, this time should remind us of something. In Romans 8, 11, it says this. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, just wait for a second. Paul says it's the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. What that means is Easter Resurrection Day, whatever you want to call it, is a work of the Spirit. And listen, as he goes on in Romans 8, 11, if, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de dead dwells in you. So as we come to, to the resurrection and, we, and we, 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 he is risen, he is risen indeed, amen. And whatever type of color shirt you have on, I have a green one, my, I have my green Easter shirt on, according to my wife. Um, <laughs> whatever you're coming to at this very moment and you're thinking about the resurrection of Christ, or maybe you've heard a sermon already today and you're like, yes, the resurrection of Christ. Understand that when you say re resurrection, you have to understand this, that one, that resurrection is impossible outside of the spirit of God based on scripture. And that that same spirit of God is now in you. And listen, as we go forward in eight, Romans 8, 11, he talking about the spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also, also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So it's not that you just have this spirit now in you, but you have this spirit that is now giving your mortal body life. And for you cessationists, that is not eternal body. That's not when we leave. That's right now. Your mortal body. We are not separated from this resurrection. See, the Christian faith is not simply hanging on one supernatural event 2,000 years ago. It is established by a supernatural event. And for the last 2,000 years, it has continued to move in supernatural power through its people. And I want to encourage you. This is where I want you to go to Ephesians 4, 7 through 8. Because this power that we're talking about, we talk a lot about power. But I want you to understand something that this power is as tangible as the resurrection of Christ was to those 500 people who had seen him raised from the dead. See, what's so interesting is we can talk about the power of God. We can say God is powerful. We can say Jesus is the, 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 the son of God. But at the end of the day, if Jesus just came and he spoke and he said a lot of great teaching and he did a lot of good things, that would make him no different than Gandhi. What makes him different 
And what proves who he is, is an actual, tangible, practical manifestation of power. And he did a lot of them. And the pinnacle was the resurrection. So in Ephesians 4, 7 through 8, we see that when, when Paul says that this power is now in us, this, this spirit is, is now in us, giving us our, 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 our new life, he begins to talk about how that works. In Ephesians 4, 7 through 8, he says this, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, let's break this down quickly. He says, but to each one of us, grace was given. The Greek word for grace comes from a root word that literally means leaning towards. It's leaning towards to share benefit. It's favor. It's a disposition that's inclined towards you. The grace of God means that God looks at you and he is inclined to you. He is leaning toward you. One of my favorite gospel singers says he's leaning in my direction. That is God's disposition towards you. He is constantly for you. And this grace that was given, we see in Ephesians 4, 7, it matches the measure of Christ's gift. What's Christ's gift? Himself. It's his, his sinless life. His death on the cross and his resurrection. He is the gift for you. He is God's gift of salvation. It's actually what scripture says. So he is our gift. So now understand this because we have to have a big view of Jesus, which is why we look at the resurrection and we're like, amen. Look, look how great God is. But I want you to understand something, church, that we are tied to that. Our power is the same power. And in here, the grace of God is the same grace and it's measured to the same measure of Christ's gift. This grace from God is not just this broad and general thing. See, because he could just say, okay, God has grace for you. That means wherever I go, God is just in favor of me. And that, that's fantastic. But, but Paul breaks it down and he gets even more specific in verse eight. That's why it begins with therefore, which means that whatever I'm getting ready to say, it's because of what I just said. So whenever you see therefore in scripture, it, me it means that you need to pay attention to what was said before. So Paul is saying, so God is giving you grace that equals Christ's gift to us. Therefore, and then he says, when he ascended on high, he led captive, a host of captives, just to give you guys that, that we were captive to sin, now we're captive to Christ. He leads us from a slave of sin to a slave of righteousness. I want you guys to understand, like we're still captives, but we're captives to Christ. But Paul is saying this, he's saying that that grace that is so big, that grace that is attached, that, or that is measured to the same gift of Christ, it translates to the gifts that I have given men. The grace of God in verse seven plays it out, plays itself out in the gifts given in verse eight. So let's get into them. So I'm going to give you a list of gifts and I'm going to tell you right now, I am not going to be hitting on the gifts. <laughs> I am. Um, but I, my plan is over the next, hopefully two weeks, I'm going to break down each each and every gift that we're, we're, we're given here. Um, so today is to function as to give you guidelines to understand how we're supposed to understand these gifts, what they're best used for. Watch those feet, son. Um, it's freaking me out. <laughs> um, and so I want you guys to take this time to say this is how we are setting ourselves up. So let me just give you gifts here. So I want to give you this caveat. Um, I'm going to give you a list of gifts that are in scripture. I do not believe that this is what they would say, like an exhaustive list. I think Paul is using these, these gifts, these particular gifts as an example, which means I think that there are more gifts. I'll get into that later. Um, but I, I think these are a picture of some of them. And I'll get into that in a second. But so first we see a list in 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to go through some of that today. Um, not the gifts themselves, but we're going to go through it. So first you see um, word of wisdom. And essentially what a word of wisdom is, it's, it's, it's a word spoken to you. 
um, by God, but it's of wisdom of, of what you should do in a matter, in a situation, either yourself or for someone else. Nine times out of 10, it's for someone else. Word of knowledge, a word of knowledge is, is God literally just dropping knowledge, you knowing something, knowing a truth about something, someone, something, maybe yourself, spiritual gift of faith. Now we're all supposed to have faith. Um, but this is essentially an extra helping. It means people who have an, an extraordinary amount of faith towards a certain thing. Gift of healing. Know what that is. Gift of miracles. Miracles are, are is that the word is actually power and might. Um, it, it literally means so like, Je so for example, Jesus healed, but then Jesus also turned the water into wine. That was a miracle. It didn't heal anybody. It was, it was just a miracle. Um, the gift of prophecy. It's important. I can't wait to talk about that because we have two views of prophecy that I think are off. Um, one is like, well, prophecy is just kind of um, proclaiming God's truth, which is that's usually the cessationist route. Um, the other route is we think that when people tell us things about ourselves, that's prophecy. When really that's word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Prophecy, the word, actually, the word, I'll break it down in a few weeks, but it means before. So it's literally the telling of things to come. Um, distinguishing of spirits. What that means is when um, pe some people have the gifting where they can tell um, if it's the spirit of God or a different spirit in the room um, or around or in someone. Gift of tongues. Most people know who tongues, what tongues are. I'll get into it. Interpretation of those tongues is a gift as well. You see a gift of administration, which is exactly what it sounds like, getting it together. If you have the gift of administration, DM us. <laughs> um, then you see the gift of helps, which is really just service. Um, and then you're going to see um, in Romans, they has, it has a, uh, um, some gifts there too. You'll see service again. You'll see a gift of teaching. You'll see a gift of exhortation, which is just encouragement. You'll see a spiritual gift of giving. Um, you'll see a spiritual gift of leadership. And you'll see a spiritual gift of mercy. So I wanted to run through those because I, I may talk about those a little bit. Um, and I want you to know what I'm talking about, but please believe I'm going to go through them um, so we understand them. But now is where I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to dig. We're going we're gonna to dig. I'm going to do it all in 30 minutes. I'm giving you guys a second. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 7. I'm going to read the first seven verses, break those down, and then I'll move on. So here it goes. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 7. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Let me just start at verse one. Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be aware. So he starts by telling them he doesn't want them to be unaware. Let me just tell you, if, if I just read those list of those gifts and you were unaware of them, that was not God's plan. God's plan is that you would be aware. Some of you may be aware, but you are simply uninterested. And my, what I would have to say to you is one side of both. God doesn't want you to be unaware. He doesn't want you to be uninterested. Can you imagine if the Holy Spirit comes and let's just say he comes like a dove. I don't know. However he comes, he shows up at your door and he just drops a bunch of gifts and you take the gifts and you just set them on the inside of your door and you go back to doing whatever you're doing. That is not how God wants you to view his gifts. Or imagine the Holy Spirit drops gifts outside of your door and you don't even know that they're there. No. See, in 1 Corinthians 12, if you were to go down to 31, Paul encourages us, you don't have to go through the whole thing, but he encouraged us to earnestly desire these gifts. And what's so interesting, that word earnestly desire is one word. And, and the Greek word means to bubble over because of being so hot. He wants you to be like boiling water when it comes towards these gifts. 
And I understand that we live in a culture where the spiritual gifts have been so abused that to have that type of, of, of zeal towards receiving a gift, it almost seems like you're obsessing over something. But I want you to know that Paul is saying that he wants your, your desire for the gifts to boil up inside of you. He echoes the same sentiment in chapter 14. And he says, desire earnestly spiritual gifts, especially that you would prophesy. He even says that I wish that you all would speak in tongues and even more that you all would prophesy. Does Paul 2000 years ago want you to speak in tongues more than you do now? Does Paul 2000 years ago want you to prophesy more than you do now? That should not be the case. Then as we move on to verse two, he says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. And then in three, he says, therefore, because of that, I want you to know, I make known to you that no one speaking by the spirit of God says Jesus is a curse and no one can say Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit. Paul's saying this to them because they were living in a different environment. And the supernatural wasn't like this new thing to them. They were surrounded by it. And for Paul, the question wasn't the existence of the supernatural, but the origin of the supernatural. And it should be for us too, because I promise you I've been in enough, I've been in enough meetings where I've seen people who were deemed spiritual, people who were deemed prophetic, but they could not say that Jesus is Lord. In this verse, what's so interesting, he's saying you, you were led to mute idols, like literally, literally little carved statues. You were led to worship them even though they were mute. But why were you led? Because there was a spirit in you. And that same spirit is a spirit that would say, Jesus is accursed. And he's saying that is not the spirit of God. Can I work that out to you right now? If you think that someone that you love, that you think is awesome, is, is, is super prophetic, but they don't have Jesus as Lord of their life, I promise you they are hearing from a spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifts, hear me, spiritual gifts are not simply spiritual awareness by really spiritual people. Spiritual gifts are gifts that come from the spirit of God and are in submission to Christ. That's important for us to know, because as we move forward, the new age movement is going more and more. And I promise you, I, I, I mean, I haven't talked to him a while, but I used to have a lot of new age friends. I guess they're still my friends. I don't know. Um, but I had a lot of new age friends and I can tell you they are some of the most spiritual people that you will ever meet. But just because someone's hearing something about you or they're hearing something about your relatives or, 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 or they know something about your personality, it does not mean that they have the spirit of God. It means they have a spirit that would say Jesus is a curse. So we have to understand this because this is important as we go forward. And I've seen, I've seen it in, in my own church. I've seen it in other people's churches. I've seen where people were deemed to have some type of spiritual strength, but their life wasn't in submission to Christ. And we have to stop before we move on and try and train them in spiritual gifts. And we have to stop and say the spirit part of your spiritual is wrong. And then as we move to four, it says this. Now, there are varieties of of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit. See, this is important because you cannot separate these gifts from the spirit of God. They all have their foundation in him. You're not getting a different spirit of prophecy. You're not getting a different spirit of, of, of discernment. You're not getting a different spirit of healing. You are getting one spirit that is manifesting itself in a bunch of different ways. And I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't proclaim to be like an expert in this, but I'll tell you this. I have seen there have been certain spiritual gifts that have always remained in me, but I have seen these spiritual gifts shift. And there have been times where I've become more spiritually gifted in certain ways. And why? And I think because in those times, especially being in ministry, the spirit was manifesting a grace, a favor that I needed for that particular ministry. 
So when you look at these spiritual gifts, yes, God is giving, I'm going to get into this. God is giving you a gift, but I want you to understand something. It is his gift. We can't own it. And now it becomes our title. Your title will forever simply be you are a son or a daughter of God. That's your title. And God will manifest a gift to you that is needed in the time. See, these gifts that we're seeing, they're actually flowing out of the sevenfold, the sevenfold ministry of the spirit that we studied in Isaiah. I won't get into it, but it's so interesting because that you're going to see that every gift that we talk about is going to match itself with somewhere in that sevenfold ministry. These gifts are a manifestation of his ministry on this earth. And this is important that we know because we often see ourselves as an expression of Christ on this earth. And we should. The church views itself as little Jesus is running around and we should. But we rarely see ourselves as the church, as an expression of the spirit of God. Yet, as we've been going through the book of Revelation, we see that in his revelation to John, this is precisely how Jesus sees the church. This is how he actually pictures the church as a manifestation of the spirit. You remember when we went through Revelation 4 and we see this throne room of God and we see the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what the Holy Spirit is pictured as? A burning lampstand. And we're told that this is the Holy Spirit. But yet when we see Jesus in Revelation 1 and he's coming in power, it says that he has seven lampstands with him. And we find out that those seven lampstands are a picture of the perfect sevenfold church. So when we are first giving a picture from Jesus of how he sees his perfect and complete church, he pictures them as lampstands. And then when we get to Revelation 4, we see that G or the Holy Spirit himself is a lampstand. Why? Because the body of the church is supposed to manifest its gifts and powers on the, on the earth in the same way that the church does. I'm sorry, in the same way that the spirit does. So as we continue to move on, let's just go back to seven. It says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So the question is, why does God give us these gifts? Is it because we would, would feel great about ourselves so that we will be able to start a spiritual gift ministry? No, we see in his own word that he's given us these gifts for the common good. The gifts are to build up the body of Christ. It's not so that you can start your own ministry. It's not so that you can be the in-house healer. It's not that you can be the prophet of the house. These weird things that people are doing, um, that's not the purpose. The purpose is that we would help build up the church for the common good of each other and into the world. See, he gives us, when we go back to Ephesians 4, you don't have to go there, but when we go back to Ephesians 4, we see that he says he gives us each grace. And it's grace for service. Grace that's specifically for you, but so that you will be able to serve. Ephesians 4.12 says this when, when and I'm going to get into more of, of, of this at a later date, but when talking about the gifts, it talks about we get particular um, positions as well, but we're seeing that these, this, this grace, these gifts are coming, and in 4.12 it says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry to the building up of the body of Christ. So Jesus is risen from the dead by the power of the Spirit. He goes back to the Father by the power of, of the Spirit, but then he gives gifts to men so that they would be able to build up the church and the saints for the work of service. The church is birthed in the power of the resurrection and then is called to serve in that same power. These are gifts that we are supposed to use. They're often treated, unfortunately, as like accessories. One of the things that's so that's so frustrating about this is like I talk to, you know, people all the time. And I, you know, I, I like to think I'm kind of in the middle, um, but I talk to I have people who are really um, conservative. I have people who friends who are really um, charismatic. And it's like both sides have the tendency to treat these gifts as kind of like 
this this accessory that they have. So like the the really really um conservative guys they like I can't talk to you about how many times I've talked to a conservative Christian who speaks in tongues and you will never like now honestly like yeah you're not gonna speak about it in 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 um in church because we'll talk about that later you're not su- supposed to um but at the same time it's almost like this secret thing like I've asked several more than I can count you know you speak in tongues and it's kind of like yeah yeah I do <laughs> but on the other side it's like <laughs> It's like this, like, it's like this shotgun. Like, it's like, it's almost like they're, you know, you ever seen in the old West of people like the, the, the gunslinger is just walking around, just waiting to use his six, his six shooter. And it's kind of like this thing. That's like this. It's almost like their special power, but they're not supposed to be used in that way. Um, our heart should be service. And how can I best serve? And God responds by giving gifts to do it with. Let us be mindful that as we figure out the best solutions to our problems, God is giving gifts in the church for this. This is what it looks like. As you're trying to figure out which way to go, Lord, where where do we go? Which is the way to do? Understand that God has given a gift of a word of wisdom. That is to tell you what to do. As the the culture grows more and more spiritual, (laughs) And the church becomes more free in its expression. Let us remember that God has given us the gift of the distinguishing between spirits so that we would never have to ask the question, is the worship good? But we would be able to ask the question, is it from God? If you feel beat up and beat down, remember the gift of tongues is given that you would be able to edify yourself. As leaders, as you seek to encourage and comfort your flock in these crazy times, know that in 1 Corinthians 14, God says that the one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. How many of you guys want edification, exhortation, and consolation to just flood your flock? Yes, I can hear you saying it now. So the only way we can do it is spiritual gifts. No, don't be stupid. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we can have and use our spiritual gifts for the very needs that we see in our church. This for it's for this reason why why Paul. I think it's Paul. Yeah, says if there. No, sorry. It is John. If, If there is anyone who is hurt among you. What does he tell you to do? If anybody needs healing, what is the what does the Bible tell you to do? Take them before the elders, let them anoint them with oil and pray for healing and they will be healed. That's supposed to be a normal ministry of the church. Not in this epic like, ah, somebody called the house healer and the healer comes in and he's got like the robe on and he flaps it off and he's like, ah, in Jesus name. Like that's weird. That's not even the picture that's painted. It's actually painted that this is just supposed to be a normal, regular thing. Who's hurting? Okay, come before the elders. So if you're care, if you're two side on this this charismatic side, and that's how you think healing is supposed to look, I would encourage you to look to your Bible. But if you're on this side and you say healing is not for today, I would tell you look to your Bible. If you are not using your gifts, you are not serving fully. In the way God has ordained his church to serve. Let's move on to verse 11. Verse 11 says this. And I'm going to read to 13. But one and the same spirit works in all these things. Distributing to each one individually. Just as he wills. For even as the body is one. And yet has many members. And all the members of the body. Though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into the body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are made to drink of one spirit. Verse 11. Here we see that we all have this same spirit. It's all manifesting from one spirit, but it says he distributes to each one individually as he wills. So it's not as if God just covers the church with a, with, with, with a blanket of gifts 
And everybody just kind of takes what they want. Um, sometimes I have this gift. Sometimes I have gift, this gift based on what we see in scripture, based on what we see in scripture, based on what we see in scripture, God has given to each individually based on what he wills, not on what we want. He is, he is given specific gifts to specific people. Later in verse 27, I know this to be true because Paul echoes and he says this in 27. He says, now you are Christ's body, Christ's body, individually members of it. He says, when talking about building the church in 28, God has appointed in the church, first the apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administration, various kinds of tongues. He's saying, so, so, so you're all one body, but many members and the member members looks like a bunch of different positions, a bunch of different gifts. And then in 29, he says this, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? Most people would agree with that. But then listen to this. All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not give, do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret do they? Your number one question when it comes to spiritual things is not do you have a certain gift and because you have that gift, you are a believer. No. The question is, do you have the spirit of God? If you have the spirit of God, you are a believer and the spirit will give you what he wills, what he wants to give you. This is important because we have to know and grow in the gifts that God has given us, not in the gifts that we idolize in other people. Now, this is not to say that you just sit there and you say, well, I'm going to ask God to give me whatever. Paul says the opposite of that. He says, earnestly desire the gifts, which means if, let's say, if you have a desire for healing, pray and ask God to give you that gift of healing. There's nothing wrong with that. And here's what also what I know. If you have a desire for a gift, it is probably because the Holy Spirit is giving you that desire. Don't think just because you want a gift, it's something, oh, everybody must want this gift. Maybe God's giving you that desire so he can give you that gift so you can seek him for it. But even as he does that, it's not so that we would work independently of others. Y'all, like, I promise you that the, the dopest way that I have seen these gifts come upon people is their desire to serve. I've seen this happen a few times. I remember I was doing a ministry with a friend of mine one time and um, a lot of people were getting saved and they were getting saved often. They were getting saved a lot. And it was funny because it seemed like one of the, the um, one of the main things about um, what was happening is people would get saved. They would get filled with the spirit and then they would come to us and say, hey, um, you know, God has saved me and I just want to be a part of this ministry and I just want to stack chairs. And we'd be like, what? Like, it was like a thing. Matter of fact, just recently, I won't call her out by name, but we had a young lady say she felt like the Lord was calling her to this church. She felt like she was being fed, like some supernatural things were happening in her life. And um, <laughs> she came over and she's talking to me and my wife. And, you know, we're asking her, so where do you feel like, like, where do you feel like you fit? And we're talking particularly about spiritual gifts. Like, what are your spiritual giftings? We were asking without asking. And she said... She, I just keep getting this picture of cleaning the toilet. And it's just like, wait, what? But do you know why though? And, and our gift of, and our understanding of spiritual gifts are so shallow in the church that we could miss it. But the Bible actually says that service is a spiritual gift. What else would happen? And, and, this, and this young lady, we know that she has other giftings. We've seen them. But for her, the Holy Spirit impressed service in her heart. Why? Because that is a spiritual gifting. And we need to understand it like that because the gifting didn't come apart from the church. It wasn't like she, she realized that she was a hand and she's just a hand flying off. No, the hand is connected to the wrist. That's connected to the forearm the, and connected to the really swole bicep and then connected to the shoulders. It's connected to the body. And this is the context of the gifts, that it's a spirit-led ministry of the body to the body and to others. 
Here we see that our unity is not just supposed to be in our faith, but also in the way that we serve. This is how we accomplish things. It's not that we're given these spiritual gifts so we can all be like X-Men. No, we're given these spiritual gifts so that we can move and accomplish the work of God. Let me show you how this works. Um, I remember one time I was teaching and um, I'm teaching at this event. And um, I remember the night before I was not able to um, really get my, my sermon together. And in those times, I didn't really do, I, I, you know, I was younger, I didn't do a whole lot of sermon prep, but I began to teach. And as I began to teach, the spirit of God just rolled out the sermon. Things that I didn't prepare, that, all, that often happens. Um, things I didn't prepare, he, he speaks to me and then I speak, right? That, that is a spiritual gift of teaching. When I, when I did that, I, I preached, it was, it was a great message, cool. Um, I'm done. And a young lady comes over to me and she says, you know, um, God, I was, I was spending time with the Lord last night and he, he impressed on me this, this thing and this, these things happen and your message went right along with what he was describing to me. I said, oh, fantastic. Amen. And it was kind of like this random thing, but it was good for her. And I began to walk away and I, and I got a, a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, because I didn't know why. It was a word of wisdom that says, have her share in front of everyone else. Uh, all right. So why don't you share it? And again, this is not like just generic truth. It was like specific to her. But she begins to share in front of this event. Everybody had to stop what they were doing and get back together. She shares in, in, in this event. And as she shares, she stops. She looks at another young lady in the crowd and she begins to prophesy to the young lady exactly what she was going through. The young lady hears that, understands that God is searching for her, and she ends up getting saved, giving her life to Christ. You see how that works? I had no thought of this young lady in the crowd. I didn't know if she was a believer or not. I didn't even know. I didn't even. It was just a crowd. But yet God reached to her through these people. The gifts are to work themselves out in the same way that a body does. If I want to go out of the door, I have to get up with my legs. I have to walk with my feet and I have to open up the door. My hand doesn't do everything. If you're a leader and you're in a church where you are doing everything and you are leading in places that you have no gifting, that's fine. Sometimes you have to do that. Keep in mind, like the way that a body works is if if one foot is a little broken or if it's not working correctly, you have to. It doesn't mean that the right foot says, well, I'm not a left foot, so I'm not walking. No. And we don't do that in the church. If you don't have the gift of service, you still need to serve. That's not how, that's not how it works. The body has to work together. But when a body is working functionally and you are working in places where you may not have gifting or you feel like you have everything to do, your first prayer is, Lord, send people who have these giftings so that the body would work in the way that it's supposed to work. Then we move to 14 to 20, and then I'm done. It says this in 14. For the body is not one member, but many. Listen to this, y'all. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for the for this is it it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were, if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. I want you guys to understand this. This is written in the context of spiritual gifts. So as we spend these next few weeks going through gifts, what I don't want to happen is there may be someone who has the spiritual gift of administration, but all the people that you love, all the people that you respect have the gift of teaching. And you are going to be tempted to have disdain for that gift of administration. And I would say to you, we need administration. It matters just as much. God is concerned with the body. As a body, we need to know what member you are and your spiritual gift is a part of that. 
So I want you to understand that if you're in this body, there is no, there's no organs that we deem to be of less at all. You're going to talk about that later. We actually should give those folks higher esteem. But as you're, as you're seeking the Lord, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to seek the Lord on this. I want you to ask him, Lord, what are my spiritual gifts? Because we live in a very, like, business, you know, charisma type. Of, like, we, we respect the people who have a lot of charisma and all these things. But I promise you, if the body is only led by people who are like me, who are fine with talking a lot, we have a lot of express, ex, ex, expressive gifts, the body won't work the same way. It won't work how God meant it to work. Not everybody's supposed to be a mouth like me. We need some people to be feet. We need some people to be toenails. And in this body, we were, I said this before, we respect toenails. Because if, if you've ever lost a toenail, you, you know how much your body needs a toenail. And so what I want you to do is, I want you to spend the next week earnestly desiring the gifts. Like God has given us a picture He's shown us, okay, these are a piece of some of the gifts. I believe some. Some people say this is all of them. I won't get into that. But read through them. And if something pokes your interest, if something piques your interest and you're saying, whoa, that's interesting, ask God. Ask God. Begin to earnestly desire these gifts without judgment, without thinking that you need to have this gift or this gift is best, this gift is better. Just ask yourself and say, Lord, how, what gift are you manifesting individually to me so that I can serve the body? So that's the groundwork of gifts. Next week, we're going to start um, with the particularly prophetic gifts. So like words of wisdom, uh, words of knowledge, prophecy, stuff like that. Um, and maybe some more. We'll see. But I want to encourage you guys to um, come back to this message before next week. Because I, believe, I really believe this is something that's on the heart of God. In Luke, Jesus says this. He gives this parable. Um, it's kind of a parable. But he says, you know, what father, if his son asks for a loaf of bread, will give him a scorpion? So absolutely not. But Jesus says, compared to my earthly father, earth, or compared to my heavenly father, earthly fathers are evil. So if, if an evil father knows how to give good gifts... How much more would my father give good gifts to those who earnestly desire the spirit? And so I believe that's what's going to happen. I believe if you if you've seen this and your your interest is peaked, I believe that God will begin to speak to you and he will begin to talk to you about spiritual gifts. I believe some of you guys already. Well, I think I don't think it's up for question. I think you already have spiritual gifts. We'll talk about it. Um, I think you already have spiritual gifts, but you're not quite sure. You don't know that that's what's happening inside of you. You think that the gifts are all of these other special ones, but really God is working mightily in you. The same resurrection power is working in your gift right now. And I believe he'll reveal it to you. So let me pray for you and then we can be done. Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. Um, God, I pray that as um, this message goes forth, that you would begin to open up eyes for people, that they would see themselves as useful um, in the body, not, not in and of their own, their own strength, not because of their wisdom, but because you have given them your spirit and there are places in their lives where your spiritual gifts are working. And so I pray that you would edify them in that, encourage them in that, and that you would give them more opportunity um, to exercise those gifts. I pray all these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Love you guys.